Also tonight, we put certain foods under the spotlight and ask if so-called superfoods or special diets can really prevent illness or even cure diseases such as cancer. Or are they, in fact, a possible danger to our health? Selling false hope to people is something that we really shouldn't be allowing or also anything that might undermine your actual treatment chances. Well, as we have grown more affluent, the amount of our weekly spending that goes on food has almost halved over 35 years and now stands at 14.7%. After a drop during the economic crash, 86% of us now perceive ourselves as healthy and a person born in 2015 in Ireland can expect over 67 years of healthy life. Despite this, there seems to be a growing obsession with that vague term wellness and the foods that may add to it or subtract from it. We're bombarded with headlines as to which food is healthy and which unhealthy. For instance, the market for gluten-free products increased by 36% in 2017 over the previous year, despite only 1% of the population being diagnosed as celiac. We hear of miracle foods and superfoods, and some foods which it's claimed can combat the diseases we dread most. So is any of this real? Can our food really cure what ails us? That's what we'll be debating later, but first, Connor Wilson has been examining the evidence. A good balanced diet is one of the keys to us staying healthy. But are there shortcuts? Does nature provide us with superfoods, silver bullets that can reduce our chance of disease? So let's talk through a few of these. This is the uh, this is kefir. This mm -hmm. has become very popular lately. It is, and I mean, it, it comes into the whole aspect of um, fermented foods, probiotics, and we do know that there is some nice benefits to the gut from fermented foods and from the probiotics and the beneficial bacteria in there. So you know, if someone wanted to use something like that, that would be fine. Okay, so this is coconut oil. This mm. is also hugely popular. There are entire sections of supermarket shelves now dedicated to coconut mm. oil. Right, so if I swirl this around my mouth or if I cook all my food in it, I'm going to be really healthy as a, as a consequence, yes? To be honest, um, we are still saying that olive oil and rapeseed oil are better options. They're a monounsaturated fat, which we know is, is very good for us in terms of the heart. Coconut oil is very high in saturated fat, um, but I think we need a lot more research before we can say, yes, the time has come to everybody using coconut oil. Can any of these foods be labelled or marketed as a superfood? Not at the moment. That constitutes a health claim. And they also, none of them can put on the packaging that they will help prevent cancer or treat cancer because, again, that's an illegal claim. We have no science to say any specific food is going to do that. Buying so-called superfoods might leave consumers out of pocket if no worse off otherwise. But diet advice based on insufficient evidence can have far more serious consequences. Last year, the Advertising Standards Authority upheld a complaint against nutritional therapist Patricia Daly, who co-wrote The Ketogenic Kitchen. The complaint centred on website claims that followers of the ketogenic diet could weaken cancer as well as enhance cancer patients' reaction to treatment. Claims that the ASAI determined could not be substantiated with scientific evidence. The ketogenic diet is a high-fat, low-carb diet. It forces the body into burning fats instead of carbohydrates, usually leading to weight loss. There have been widespread claims about its supposed benefits to cancer patients. So the reason people think the ketogenic diet might be beneficial for cancer is a misunderstanding of something that actually happens inside tumours. We know that inside tumours and tumour cells, that they tend to use uh, glucose in a different way than healthy cells do. They tend to use more glucose. We now know that's a consequence of cancer and not a cause. However, that misunderstood kernel of truth is now translated into um, glucose or sugar feeds your cancer and therefore if you don't take it or you just take proteins or something else it will stave off cancer and that's a horrible misunderstanding because all your cells need glucose and your body doesn't discriminate between a, a carbohydrate from a carrot or a cake it takes it in and it uses it so this kernel of truth about something that is different in tumor metabolism has been horrifically misunderstood and has now become part of this uh, common vocabulary of, of, of diet advice from unqualified people. For example, if people lose far too much weight when they shouldn't be losing weight, when they're already struggling with a disease which is probably pushing their weight down and causing them to get inadequate nutrition, you set up a situation which is a perfect storm for you know, a poor prognosis and a poor outcome. 
There are many other baseless claims about certain foods and their alleged cancer-busting properties. Cancer dies in just 42 hours. And despite warnings from health bodies and cancer research trusts, the claims persist. More seriously, due to an acute health risk, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland advises against eating apricot kernels. They contain a compound that converts to cyanide when consumed and in large amounts can be fatal. People with cancer are incredibly vulnerable. And if you have someone on the sideline telling them, oh, we have this thing that'll cure it, this panacea, it's very, very tempting. And it's very, very tempting to maybe forsake your traditional therapy for, the, for these promises, even if your doctors are advising against it. Selling false hope to people is something that we really shouldn't be allowing, or also anything that might undermine your actual treatment chances. I'm having my first chemo of cycle five. Chemotherapy worked really well for me, and I am alive and I am healthy because I did what my doctors told me to do. It, I got some messages from people um, suggesting that I follow doctor so-and-so's you know alternative diet which is you know better than chemo um, and to be honest I don't think there was anything else during my treatment that made me so angry Connor Wilson reporting there I'm now joined in studio by Mike Gibney who's the Emeritus Professor of Food and Health at UCD and Ivor Cummins who's co-author of a book called Eat Rich Live Long you've also got a blog called The Fat Emperor and I know you want to say that you wrote your book with a medical doctor as well that's important to you right Ivor okay listen isn't dietary advice really as simple as the author and activist Michael Pollan put it in seven words which are eat food not too much mostly plants well, in an e ideal world, Miriam, it would be, but unfortunately, and many people may not be aware, uh, a study came out last year that 52% of American adults are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Now, it's an arbitrary distinction. They're essentially diabetic. So if most of your population is essentially diabetic, you've got to be really careful because that means they're carbohydrate intolerant by definition. So when we push a very high-carb food pyramid, and the majority of your people are essentially diabetic, that's a challenge, shall we say. You have a blog, as I said, called The Fat Emperor. And in your book, in your book I think you have a chapter on cancer avoidance strategies. You're an evangelist slightly, I think, aren't you? Mm. For ketogenics, well, yep, yeah, right. And we just heard there in the film there, people, and it was very interesting to watch them, who believe that the ketogenic diet can treat cancer. But as we heard, it's based on a huge misunderstanding. Yeah, well, the, actually, the thing about glucose is if you cut the glucose in your diet, your liver can pump out any amount of glucose that's needed through gluconeogenesis. So although a ketogenic diet will lower the glucose somewhat, your liver will keep pumping out glucose. So that's the misunderstanding. Now, the ketogenic diet will also pump out beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body associated with ketogenic diets. And that may have some effects, but I think the key thing is the research. I've interviewed many doctors and professors doing human research mm -hmm. on this, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, Dr. Colin Champ, Champ. And uh, it's very interesting science, but they'd all say the science is in the middle of being explored. Mike, give me. Well, uh, I think you're absolutely right that the advice on healthy eating is pretty simple. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with Michael Pollan on everything, but I think his seven words there are not unfair. Um, and I think that uh, what we've heard in that clip there is um, a lot of un quite seriously unsubstantiated uh, material, um, but that's not new. Um, it's been there for centuries. The only difference is that today we have social media, and social media drives it at a fantastic rate. We have the entry now of... Uh, celebrity sports stars, chefs and the like who have strong opinions on food and health and they get a huge audience and they are uh, answerable to nobody in terms of pure Can science. Ask you something? Does it matter for instance if someone uh, you know extols the virtues of a ketogenic diet and in fact if otherwise healthy people are just a bit overweight and this helps them lose weight does it do any harm, this kind of stuff? No, I'm, I'm all for it, it, if it doesn't do any harm mm. let them do it. I mean this is a you know with a free world to do. Uh, I, I can't see any harm in doing, uh, going on a ketogenic diet except in cancer. That's where it would have a serious problem. Mm. And the problem there is that 
Uh, cancer is strongly associated with cachexia. It's strongly associated with weight loss, in particular muscle loss. Mm. And Ivor was talking there about the liver will pump out uh, glucose to gluconeogenesis. Well, that's because it's breaking down amino acids, which are required uh, for proteins. That's where it derives its uh, glucose from. So I would say if, if you want to go on a, on a, a diet, you know, to, to, to lose weight or look good and the keto diet attracts you, fine. But if you're talking okay. about cancer, about no way. Yeah. No, glucogeneogenesis also takes advantage of the glycerol from the fat and takes the sugar backbone from glycerol. So there are many substrates going into that cycle. But let's make it simple, because yeah, I'm worried yeah. my okay. viewers yeah. at this yeah, stage yeah, are bamboozled. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, put simply, put si the notion that a ketogenic diet in some way either treats cancer, that's wrong. No, that is current research, ongoing nine to ten human trials, and you can't speak on it until the research is complete. But surely, if there was any truth in it, every oncologist and dietitian mm. on the planet would be advocating a ketogenic diet. Uh, well, not when the science isn't all in. No, you can't unless there are published and accepted reports that validate it. And it also, there's emerging evidence that it may be negative for some cancers, may be positive for others. So well, until that's worked right, out, right now, the state yeah. of the art says it's not, it's not a player in the game. So it, it may well be a player mm. in five years or 50 years or 100 years, mm. but there are people with cancer today being treated mm. with cancer. And everyone involved in that has to deal with what's on the plate today, what we know today. Yeah. And we know, we have no evidence mm. to say it works. No evidence whatsoever to say it prevents or cures or treats cancer. Okay. And Are you accepting I, that? I am accepting that, that it is obviously a work in progress in many teams all over the world assessing it. Now, it may very well turn out, as you say, and it may get conclusively closed. The ketogenic diet is primarily for diabetes. As we said, the majority of adult Americans are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Averta Health recently, using a ketogenic diet with several hundred diabetics, uh, in a year got 94% massively reduced or off their medications, 60% regressed. Ketogenic diet is more currently for diabetes and for obesity and for those chronic diseases. Isn't it gone, Mike? Give me a minute. Well, I mean, I can't accept that because the, the evidence from the National Institute of Health is that it really doesn't matter where your calories come from, that if you restrict your energy intake, you will lose weight. And the problem with diabetes in the United States is we have obesity, and the cure of that is to reduce weight. And the NIH-funded studies show emphatically there is no difference. And that's in population intervention studies. And I just want to ask you a different with. question, which is that, you know, isn't the notion, what Connor was talking about there in his film, clean eating, diet to combat disease movements, they live off two groups of people, either the vulnerable who are ill or the worried well. I will say, Miriam, that almost nothing in that video resonated with me whatsoever. And I agree there is an enormous amount of shillery out there. Unless you are buying a publication which is uh, engaged with a doctor, a full medical doctor like myself, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, he's a fellow of the Pr Practitioners Association, I would be highly suspect of any information you're getting on the internet, to be quite honest. Well, I would go further than that. A single doctor wouldn't uh, matter a hoot to me. I'd be more concerned about the World Health Organization and what it has to say and all the global advice it gets. Well, and I'd follow their, their yeah. advice. The World Health Organization recently came out with severe restrictions on sugar. And yet I get a sense from some of the people in that video that sugar may be not so problematic. It's, it's not correct to say they've, they've had a 10% energy from sugar for the last 35 years. They've come now to say that 5% might be a better idea. Yes. But they, would, they have the standard advice still is around the world hasn't changed yeah. in 30 years. Well, on the point, if I could, uh, on the point of it being ten calories seconds. only, 10 seconds, the Gardner study just came out, and there are countless more, whereby re taking away all processed food and sugars and without calorie reduction, they've seen up to a stone six kilo loss within a year. And Verta Health are doing the same without changing okay, calories. One and sentence and endless going. science on that. It's the calories that count. And okay. in 10 years, it'll be interesting. Professor Gibney. Yeah. Ivor Cummins, I appreciate you both coming in. Davis. Thank you.